Hello, and welcome to the next Stitch Witch Diaries. We are squarely in lunar herbs, herbs of the moon, and we are going to kick it off with Raven, so take it away. All right, Kava Kava. Um, oh. Now, a lot of places, Kava Kava, a lot of places just call this uh, plant Kava, which is just like a shortened version, but Kava and Kava Kava are the same plants generally. Okay, so some basics. Latin name is Piper Menthisticum. Menthisticum. Mysticum. Uh, folk names are Awa, Mystica. Mm. Oh, yeah. Mysticum. Okay. Mysticum. Folk names are Awa in Hawaii, <laughs> Kava, um, Saikau, and Yokona. And then also intoxicating pepper, Ava, Ava pepper, Ava root, um, and Awa root. Parts used the dried roots, if you couldn't tell from the folk names. <laughs> now, it is a traditional beverage in uh, Pacific and South Sea Island communities where it is consumed the most typically until recently. Um, and it's consumed socially. It's a very social um, drink. The drink that they make with kava is very like um, social gathering type of drink. It's also associated with a lot of festivities like weddings, uh, family functions, um, and rituals. I have, um, I think three, uh, lores, like lore stories, and they're pretty lengthy. So here we go. Okay. So one of the most prevalent Kava origin stories is from the Tonga, which is in Polynesia. And in the story, it said that a couple was living alone with their only daughter, whose name was Kava, on one of the islands. And then one day, the sacred king of Tonga, along with some of his men, were looking for foods, uh, food and a place to rest. So they came to the island, started searching around for food. There was no food, um, and so they were they couldn't find any food. So they went into um, like the where people were living, um, and the only person who was like available was this couple, and the couple did not have any food to give the king, and so the king or the couple decided to make a sacrifice of their daughter to show the king respect and to honor him and to make peace. Um, and then later they found that uh, where they had buried the daughter's body after the sacrifice, there was two plants that had grown on that grave. Um, and they also noticed two rats were in the plants that were growing out of the grave. Um, and that once the rat, they're kind of stumbling around. Um, and so the plant was, one of the plants was kava. They named kava after their daughter. And the other plant is believed to be sugar cane. Um, and so from that point on, kava with its like intoxicating uh, kind of almost uh -oh. alcohol-ish properties became an important ceremonial drink. Uh, so once again, we... Well, oh, there we go. Um, so that is an interesting um, story. It's interesting that the parents wanted to sacrifice their daughter just to make the king happy. But, but you know, women sacrifice is what we talk about quite often. Um, so um, the another uh, story was that Kava was brought to the islands from um, Kaiki which is the allegedly the ancestral homeland of Hawaiian people. Um, and so in a lot of myths, kava was imported uh, onto the Hawaiian islands by the gods Cain and Kanola. Um, and these are like big well-known gods in the Hawaiian pantheon. Um, and they always appear together, which is interesting. So they pretty much just survived off of kava. They ate the kava plants. That's what sustained them. Um, and so they are discussed as like the first kava farmers. Nice. So it's said that they, uh, came to the Hawaiian islands and planted kava, but there wasn't enough water for everywhere they wanted to plant the kava so they ended up creating springs like springs to flow water through where the kava plants were where they planted them um and so there was always a uh, like 
gracious amount of water around the kava plants. Also, they planted kava near um, other foods that were considered staples of the region. So they would always plant kava plants next to banana, taro, and sugar cane. And so because they didn't eat that food, they only ate the kava, but they planted that food for the people. And so because the they always made sure that kava got the sunlight and the water that they needed, and it was always planted next to these plants. These plants always thrived. Um, and they also, oh, so then the farmers started like praying to the gods whenever there needed to be more water flowing or if the plants weren't doing well. And so it became highly associated with farmers. Um, so then we have um, Ewa, which is the drink made from the plant, which we'll talk about how to make later. Um, and it was used as an offering to these gods. Um, also, only specific groups of people were allowed to drink the drink. So um, chiefs and anybody who was considered very high ranks, and then medicine men and fishermen and farmers. Also, this is, so there was a lot of chants, uh, which they call meles, which are um, associated with kava. Um, and so it said the farmers and the fishermen and people who were like planting the kava would chant these chants. I don't know, um, I didn't listen to it in like chant song form, but I'll read it to you. So it says, you can cause the Ewa stalks to grow and fill the planting holes with the dark Ewa, which the rat likes to eat, the sacred Ewa of my father. Oh, I gotta move my windows. There we go. Uh, let the rains increase the Ewa. Oh, the Ewa's growth. So that's one of the chants that they would um, use in ritual. Nice. So then we have another uh, place of lore. So the uh, there's a Malaysian legend that talks about how the first kava plant was created by the god of agriculture, whose name was Kwat. And so um, Kwat was concerned that the people of his lands were not able to grow enough food to keep themselves fed. So he decided to grow a new plant that would be very easy to grow and easy to source and give them nourishment. Um, so he went to a sacred cave in the mountains where he looked for some type of suitable root to kind of attached to this new plant. Um, and so he found a very small, uns unassuming root that seemed sturdy and uh, good for his use. So then he took the root and planted it in a special garden right outside of the cave. And the root grew very, very quickly and it grew a very large lush plant with thick stems, beautiful green leaves. And so Quatz was pleased with his creation and decided to share it with the people. He plant, he called the plant kava and taught them how to cultivate it because it was very easy to cultivate. Um, and then they could eat the roots. So Quatz gave instructions for the people on how to chew it and mix it with water. Um, and then that drink was believed to, believed to have a very calming effect and also bring people together socially. So um, he told them to use it for ceremonial, ceremonial events. Awesome. Yeah, and then I think this is the last little part of, oh no, two more parts. <laughs> so um, he also taught, so he taught the people to plant the kava plants, how to make different varieties of this drink depending on the occasion. So in, for some occasions you would chew the root for some, um, celebrations you would grind it sometimes you would put it in water sometimes you would put it in other things so he taught them different ways to make it for specific uses um, and he also is said to really emphasize the importance of keeping it the plant pure so not mixing it with any other plants it was very important he believed to like keep it its own plant Oh, and he said that if people did start kind of blending it, that it would lose its power of like calming and bringing people together. Yes. Um, yeah, so this kind of just says that, yeah, the people did it. So um, according to the legend, people started using it the way that he said they were started using it in cultures and celebrations. And so it was, has been passed down throughout the generations. Nice. Then we have a Samoan lore. So in the Samoan lore, um, there was an annual sun sacrifice of a girl. And one year the girl um, was very, very beautiful and her name was Ui. 
Um, and so she was offered to the sun God and the sun God was so pleased by her and like her beauty that he, um, took her as his wife. So he married her. And then after some time they came to an agreement that she was pregnant and they came to an agreement that she could go back to the land of her people to give birth to, to the child. Um, and so she, he kind of like flew her through the sky to go back to her people. Um, but in the process of that, she miscarried. And when she landed, she, um, like gave birth to this stillborn, um, on water and it was floating down the river. And then this fetus, this baby, the stillborn was picking up by a hermit crab and the hermit crab took care of it and brought it back to life. Um, and so the child whose name was Tagula'u, uh, when he grew up, he taught the mortal people how to make kava and use it as like a ceremonial plant. So a lot of lore. Yes. So um, typically you're not going to just eat the root. You, I don't know if you can. All discussions are of it used in a drink. Um, all the discussions. Yeah, remember we had. did that. Yeah, well, I'm going to talk about that. Okay, but okay. I, do you know if people can just eat the root? I don't think so. It's horrible. I don't think so either. <laughs> it's just, yeah. It's, it's the drink rough. is bad enough and you're not. Even yeah, <laughs> I feel like it's rough. <laughs> yeah okay um, <laughs> I don't know. So, and it's really so hard the, I think I think we had a real hard time like like it's, oh no. that's why it's best uh are we back yeah. it's best to get it powdered yeah I think so because, uh -oh. yeah yeah I'm gonna talk about that too yeah. okay good okay okay so there are three methods of creating this drink so typically the roots are going to be chewed or ground and then added to some type of liquid, or they can be used alone. So there's three methods here. First is hot water. So with the hot water, you're basically just creating an infusion. So you put the nut milk in a bag, um, and then you put that in an empty bowl and you pour hot water over that bowl, just like you would if you're making an infusion, let it sit for five to 10 minutes. Then typically you're going to squeeze out the water. Um, and then, um, like keep doing it. You're basically going to continue kind of, um, squeezing out the water until it, the liquid becomes brown and a little bit oily. And then you're going to drink a half a cup at a time. Um, and then what we did, I put a notes in my document, um, after we drank it and the first time, and, uh, uh we said to wait 15 minutes uh, before you, um, try it again, try drink another cup. It is. Yeah, it is not, um, it's not super pleasant, but no. you know, <laughs> yeah, it was rough. That's all I have yeah. to say. Woo. Yeah. It tastes like spunky. <laughs> like mm, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. got a thing. Yeah. yeah. It, okay. it, has, it must have to grow on you. You know, I kind of feel that yeah. way about some, about there are some other, like, I think that yerba mate has to grow on you a little bit. It's got like a pretty unique mm. flavor that like you have to kind of get used to yeah. a little bit and it's got like sure. a, a kind of texture to it. Exactly. Yeah. So, and I, it's probably good that it doesn't taste great because then people might be consuming it all the time and it wouldn't be like, um, I don't know, like special, I guess anymore. I don't know. <laughs> Um, so th the second method is with cooled liquid. So essentially you're going to put the, um, powdered or like macerated root into a nut bag or like an infusion bag or something. Then you're going to put it in either cold water or coconut or cold coconut milk, and you're going to knead it. So you're essentially going to like put it in this cup or this bowl and then put your hand in the cup or the bowl and just kind of like squeeze it continuously, um, for about 10 minutes. And then you drink the liquid. Uh, you can also do it as a standalone, which I've never done. It doesn't sound pleasant, but this is the uh, one of the traditional ways of consuming it is you basically take the root and you put it in the back of your mouth. So like over your molars and you specifically use your molars to chew it hmm. and you're just swallowing the saliva while you chew it. Kind of like you would do like chew a little bit like chewing tobacco, um, but you're actually chewing it and then you swallow it and then you're going to spit the root out eventually. Yeah, I don't know that the roots uh, are edible, like actually, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't heard of anybody ever, yeah. like, swallowing the root. 
Um, so the things that are responsible for the medicinal benefits and like the intoxicative slightly qualities of kava kava is kava lactones, lactones, kava lactones, uh, which it is comprised of a bunch of different chemicals. I'm not even going to try to say these chemicals, but these are the chemicals that create the, um, the kava lactones, which gives kava kava its medicinal and intoxicating qualities. Um, so they are psychoactive um, and, but they interact with the central nervous system. First of all, not doctors, right? We're not doctors. So I'm not telling you to like get off of your like antipsychotics or something and start <laughs> taking kava. Okay. But it's, uh, but, yeah. Some people say that um, it interacts with your central nervous system in a different way than typical like drugs. Um, and so it can be beneficial, even if um, like other anti, it's, it says psych, um, psychiatric, but typically we're referring to antipsychotics when we talk about that, not always, but typically. Um, and so it said that if you don't respond well to those types of drugs, perhaps kava might work. Um, and then there have been animal studies and human studies that can that have found that these uh, kava lactones can reduce convulsions, they can help sleep and relax muscles. Um, and also, allegedly, it can help with anxiety disorders, things like agoraphobia, which if you're not familiar with that, that a lot of people think that's a fear of going outside. It's not. It's just a fear of being in a public space. So you there's like a high, high, high level of anxiety when you go out to anywhere where there's people. Yeah. Um, it, you Typically, people with agoraphobia, agoraphobia can go like in their backyard. Like that's mm -hmm. not a problem for them. Um, generalized anxiety disorder, um, panic disorder, and like other types of just anxiety disorders. So medicinally, it's an anesthetic, anodyne, antiseptic. I think that that is definitely spelled wrong. That is Afro. not right. <laughs> that word. I can promise you. I, know. I, I know. think that I, <laughs> I think at this point I was using the speak to type. Oh thing. yeah. Oh, nice. I don't know how to spell it. Uh, it's D I S I A C. Maybe I always spell it wrong every mm -hmm. time. I do too. Huh? We'll see. Well, you get it. It looks better. <laughs> um, it looks better. Aphrodisiac, <laughs> uh, stimulant, tranquilizer, diuretic, nervine, antispasmodic, anti-inflammatory, and carminative. Um, it's often used to help anxiety and stress. You can, it also has a numbing quality to it. So like if you have a sore throat, you can chew on the roots. Um, again, don't swallow the roots, but chew on the roots and it'll numb your throat. And uh, there's been studies that show that the numbing effect is just as good as, uh, what are they called? Like the throat numbing sprays that you like. Oh, yeah, like throat. Base, yeah, the fluoroseptic, like the yes, 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 exactly. Yeah. Oh, yes, oh my <laughs> god, those are lifesavers when I have a sore throat. Holy cow! But kava kava's numbing is said to be like as good as the chloroseptic. Um, now, I do want to note that there have been some cases. So in the last, I think it's like 40 years, there's been something like 20 cases. Uh, but still want to note it of cases of people with limb or damage, but it's only really reported in Europe. We haven't seen any of these reports in America. Um, and also some of the researchers, uh, when people have the liver damage, it's found that they're also taking other things. So other yeah. like drugs, um, or alcohol or something. And so we don't know if the damage is from the kava kava or if it's from the combination of kava with these other things. So just, you know, as usual, be responsible. Okay, magically it's associated with uh, the moon. And then I found um, one place said Saturn, I can't remember where, and then Bayrell said Pluto. Um, and the heart chakra and the third eye chakra, the element is water and the sign is Aquarius. Nice. Yeah. It is associated with psychic powers. It is considered a high uh, visionary herb. Um, so that's a huge, those two are huge associations with the moon. I also, oh, I didn't, I don't think I said this. I also associate the moon with magic in general. Like I, I think that's why a lot of 
practitioners and like witches and druids and everybody kind of does a lot of rituals under like the moon and the full moon and so I the moon is often like highly associated with magic and that type of stuff which is there's like um, books written about calling down the power of the moon yeah exactly like whole, like, exactly yeah things yeah <laughs> yeah I don't really draw down the moon but there is there's been whole books written about it I associate it uh, with pra- my practice with the moon because I, first of all, just like nighttime. And I think that moon is just kind of associated with magic and fertility and abundance and flowing and very associated with women and femininity. So yes, I did not say that earlier, but I do associate the moon with magic. So visionary herb and psychic powers are clearly associations with the moon, sex rituals, uh, protection. Also, kava is considered a teacher plant. Um, so it like teaches you information about yourself while you're consuming it and working with it. Um, it's said to heal the relationship between the mind, body, and the spirit so that the three can be kind of attuned to one another. Uh, connects to the creative center and also associated with self-love. That's it. Awesome. Very nice. Excellent. I am so excited to learn about Kava Kava. That was great. And yes, we had a little bit of an experience with Kava Kava ourselves. Yeah, yeah. The experience <laughs> was nice. The taste bag. wasn't super great. It wasn't. <laughs> I, had, I had to buy though a milk bag too for it. Like mm. that's because it's a milk bag is different mm. than even like any other kind of sieve. It's really, really fine. So yeah. you have to have that because you don't want any of that root in there yeah. and it's better to do it powdered. So you really need yeah. that, that milk bag. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> if all, I think that if you have absolutely no access to a milk bag, which I'm sure you get them on Amazon, but if you want to use like a cheesecloth, make sure that you're folding it over like six times or like as many times as you possibly can, because yeah, the milk bags have the holes are so teeny tiny. Yeah, or so like, super um, beneficial. or if another one that I use sometimes is um, pantyhose, but like mm. knee highs, go buy a thing of knee highs and double it up or something, yeah. you know, so that like yeah. you're, yeah. And then you kind of just mm. let it drip. Like it kind of just like, it's mm. like almost just like drips, like from the bottom, like one little drip at a time. So yeah, very nice. Excellent. Well, we will see you at the next Ditch Witch Diaries.